You're listening to the Pentaract Poetry Podcast, hosted by Anthony Etherin. Hello, welcome to episode four of the Pentaract Poetry Podcast. My guest this time is Nasser Hussein. He is a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University. He is a Ledbury emerging critic, and he is, of course, a poet. I met up with Nasser a few weeks ago to discuss poetic movements, airport codes, and writing poems with knives. As ever, I began by asking what made him a poet. Well, the first poem I think that I ever really consciously wrote was an assignment for uh, a university class. Um, Janelle Genstad, who I believe is a professor now at Victoria in Canada, um, she taught me Renaissance Lit, and... We were studying sonnets. She asked the class to write a sonnet as um, an early assignment. And um, I remember I remember mine being, you know, not bad. It was technically like solid sonnet, but with this like really cheeky reference to postmodernism at the end of it, um, because I thought I could, you know, I could be that clever Um uh, and and update the form on my first ever poem, you know. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was pretty cocky, you know, as a 23, 24-year-old kid, I think. Um, and, uh, but that, I think that she she really liked it. I got a pretty good grade on it. And that kind of started a, a bug, that kind of, I kind of caught the bug from that. Um, after that, it was... Uh, it was really just a byproduct of all the reading I was doing in my undergraduate degree. And I, I was gifted with a number of, of fantastic tutors who exposed me to, you know, the canon and beyond. Um, I, I, and I seem to remember um, Jed Razzola once. Um, I was lucky enough to take a class with him in American literature. And I don't really remember the poem he was talking about. I can't, like I couldn't reference it, but this memory of it sticks in my head, and it just sounded like this sort of acid fueled, mad sort of epic long poem. So I immediately thought, "Oh, I can do that," and went back to my bedroom and started writing this ridiculous epic poem about three guys who are trying to, you know, live through the apocalypse with a asteroid called Mick Jagger hitting the planet it was you know it was all sponsored by Pepsi um, there was a, a sentient palm pilot which I think dates the poem anyway it was it was just an unpublishable mess but but that was that was the whole that was my first taste of the freedom that that poetry and writing and creatively gives you so yeah I think ever since then I've uh I've just tried to recapture that sense of freedom and fun. Yeah, I was going to say there's something impulsive and experimental about what you're saying there, and you carry that on. Yeah, well, that's 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 my hope. I think that's what that's what I want my practice to be mostly about is kind of uh, not uh, impulsive, maybe too strong a word, but 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 yeah, that impulse to have fun, to to refresh language to to find new angles on things that's that and 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 anything that makes me smile um ultimately is kind of my goal i suppose um so that's what keeps me going um and i think that's probably as important as important as it is to know how one gets started i think it's just as important to think about what keeps me going because it can be counterintuitive to keep writing poems sometimes when you think about the rewards such as they are but yeah I think I think the sharing the fun and the joy and the that impulse to language itself is is kind of the the thing that keeps me going and and was lit up um for me in in yeah my undergraduate years when I was reading maybe the widest possible scope of things that I had ever tried to do before, you know. And this was in Canada? That was in Canada, Queen's University. And then from there, um, I I got into a creative writing MA, and then that kind of formalized the process um, of, of 
creative writing for me. Yeah, you've, you've lived and worked in both Canada and the UK. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, it strikes me that the poetry is viewed very differently in those two countries. So I can't imagine the UK celebrating a poet like B.P. Nicol, the way Canada does. So maybe there's a lot more of a, an experimental attitude out there. Well, you know, it's it's kind of a personal mission for me to bring B.P.'s stuff to the UK. And and the, the, the best part, of it, well, I mean, it's not really a mission, but it seems to be evolving in that direction. Um, yeah, I, I, every, everybody I've ever shown almost, almost to a, a person, um, has, as soon as you expose them to some of the great Canadian experimental writers, BP Nichols, Steve McCaffrey, Darren Wurschler, Bill Bissett, um, Adina Karasik, um, the, the, the reception is almost universal and positive, um, at every turn, um. So, so I don't know that it's viewed very differently. I just, it, perhaps, ugh, I can't really say this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, I could cut it if you change your mind. <laughs> perhaps there is this weight of tradition. I don't want to do a new world, old world kind of basic dichotomy here, but, um, but it must be hard. I mean, I, I don't really know because I'm not, I'm not British in, in at least culturally speaking, um, in a lot of ways, but, um, but I can only imagine what that must be like to, to have such a thick and deep and globally influential canon of literary practice, um, kind of behind you. I, I wonder if that doesn't in some small sense account for, um, how difficult, not difficult. You see, I, there are so many assumptions and, and, and general statements that I'm making here, but let's let, for the sake of argument, suggest that it's kind of difficult to be experimental in the UK. I'm not sure that that's actually true, but if that's the case, then perhaps it is that kind of weight of tradition. Um, that, that, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of experimental poets in the UK. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the, that they're sort of, they're, uh, Excluded but, is a harsh word, but they, you know, they yeah. don't, they can't quite get to certain places. So, but, so if I think of like someone like um, Tom Rayworth, is it Rayworth or Raworth? I've never read really Rayworth. Read, but Rayworth. Um, so if I think of Tom Rayworth and his like the the obvious and deep affiliation that he has with language poetry from the eighties, um, he seems to be kind of alone over here in the UK in that sense, whereas in the states. Um, at the time, you had a kind of much more what looks, at least on paper, like a much more robust community of writers working in these in these kind of outre, avant garde, what have you, um, kind of mode. Um, so yeah, that's uh, you know it's impossible. You know, for I'm, I can I, I imagine there are a bunch of like. UK experimentalists gnashing their teeth right now. And of course, I, you know, I want to be proven wrong on that. There's, there's lots of room for everyone to, to be experimenting. Um, is it different? I'm not really sure between Canada and the UK, but there, but because of people like BP Nickel, Christian book, who's been on the podcast before, um, you know, um, Derek Beaulieu, um, again, Darren Wurschler, um, because of that that kind of tradition that was inaugurated by BP Nickel before Horseman Stephen Caffrey, I think there is a pretty healthy um, attitude to experimental avant garde kinds of modes of literary practice in Canada. Uh, last weekend, I I tweeted a you know playful scamp that I am. <laughs> I, tweet, I, I, I tweeted about starting a new poetic movement. And you, you're one of the first people to reply. Yeah, love, love that. You know, that's the kind of conceptual play that I'm. I absolutely, you know, I love, I love just naming things and then letting other people sort of try and do it. Look at what they are. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm just the ideas guy, but yeah. What, what did we end up with? A new formalism would be like formalism. Well, I, I suggested uh, multi-formalism or pan-formalism, which right. are very functional names. 
and then you suggested ormalism <laughs> and then and ormalism and then i changed the ants to an ampersand i love ampersand ormalism and ormalism yeah. that that makes me chuckle and it seems appropriate right yeah it's but this is something that going back to what we were saying before then do you think there's a possibility of uh, an experimental movement having an impact in the uk or actually globally yeah um i suppose i suppose it's we may be past the point where we can even really talk about national boundaries yeah in in you know maybe linguistic boundaries but even those seem kind of to think to think that way seems kind of out of date but but to to have impact full stop um as a yeah as a mo movements and groups those are useful i always think of like um Charles Bernstein, I think it was Charles who said something along the lines of schools of poetry are for people who haven't read all the poetry. Um, so, yeah, I can talk about the New York school, but it's not like I've read all of the New York school, you know, because I find the the more I dig into schools of poetry, the, the sooner it becomes obvious that it, most schools of poetry aren't uniform or monolithic or, or aren't as uniform or monolithic as the name might imply yeah it's um, a funny thing that poets tend to be individualists you know, you know you want your own expression to be heard and yet yeah. we kind of band together into these these movements yeah and and i i mean you know i i i just try and keep my affiliations really loose you know as much as possible because it's important for me to try and push my practice into all kinds of different areas. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what the, you know, if I'm being experimental, then there's no way I can know what the next project is going to look like. And, you know, some of my recent stuff has, has kind of, you know, I've spent the last sort of year or so talking about airports. Um, because I kind of have well, to. Well, sorry, because guess what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that's coming, right? But, um, but you know, I can't use the same sort of modes or techniques or attitudes in my next, in my future work, because that would just be redundant and, you know, wouldn't really get me anywhere as a writer or a thinker or a critic or a poet. Um, but yeah, the the idea that we band together under you know, more under these banners or titles. I think, I think they're useful, you know, but I would, I would love to see Andormalism take off. I think that's a great idea. Let's do I it. think it should be a kind of revolving door um, rather than a, rather than a kind of like brand, you know, that, that everyone takes on once and for all. Uh, at least I'd like to think of a future of poetry where, where people can be in and out, you know, do be ormalist for a little while and then go off and do something else and then come back and the door is always open, you know, um, yeah. like a gym membership and you pay for a year and you never show <laughs> up, you know, that would be great. Why not? Um, yeah, I like, I like the, uh, I like the idea of the, the and ormalist the, the, that's capacious enough for for all kinds of different things yeah i mean the idea was anything anything to do with form yeah. which when you think about it is is quite broad <laughs> yeah right that's literally poetry i think yeah. <laughs> you know maybe, maybe it's too broad then <laughs> maybe coextensive with the art i was thinking of like orphanism i wanted to like recuperate lost language you know then sort of tilt towards sound or not sound but found poetry and um yeah kind of rehoming these these otherwise overlooked bits of things i think that's that's where i'm getting a lot of enjoyment these days well, do you can do you consider skywriting's found poetry then since you're using <laughs> small found elements yeah yeah i think that was it's finding yeah it's it's different from what i think orthodox if if i can even say that uh, orthodox found poetry might be right which is to you kind of lift this chunk of language out of another already existing place or text whereas with like 
skywriting, I had to find the vocabulary itself in the list of in these lists of airport codes. So to that extent, yeah, it's definitely found because I didn't have uh, I didn't have all the words right away. So I had to go out and look for them within this field. Um, and then the other sense of found poetry in terms of like, yeah, finding it in this kind of overlooked space. Yeah, I think that's happening as, as well in skywriting. So so a lot of the philosophy ethos of found poetry is in there. Um, even though I'm also remixing and rewriting and um, retelling lots of things and, you know, experimenting with sound and form. So, so, so it does do a whole bunch of, of moves, but certainly, yeah, I, I would say a major platform inside of that work is this idea of finding it. Yeah. Uh, would you like to just very briefly describe skywriting? So in, for any, in case anyone hasn't heard you talking about it. Uh, yeah. yeah I've, I, I'm sure lots of people haven't heard about it, but skywritings um, was published uh, in late 2018 by Coach House Books. Shout out to Coach House. Um, and it is a book of poems composed entirely out of three-letter IATA airport codes, um, like Man for Manchester, or more obscurely, T-H-E for Teresina, Brazil, or A-N-D for Griffin Sandusky Airport. Um, and I could go on, but that would be tedious in the extreme. So you, did you begin with the concept then? I mean, the idea for the whole book, was was that set out before you wrote anything? Or did you just mess around one day with a few of them and come up with one poem that ignited the idea for a whole book of poems? Right. Um, I think, well, it all started at Manchester, uh, Manchester Airport. Um, in 2016, 2017, I think. No, 2016, when I noticed that um, MAN made a little word. Um, and from that point forward, um, yeah, I had to start collecting the words in the first place. Um, so, yeah, once again, I didn't, I, like, the question was, I wonder how many airports make these little words, right? So it wasn't a, an idea for a book at that point. You, you, you didn't think... I, I'm going to write a book out of these. Yeah, exactly. Like it was that I couldn't, uh, I could have at that moment found out that there were only 10 words. Right. Um, and then the project would have just never happened. Um, so, so the first, the first step was to just go through all these lists of airports and try and find as many words that qualified for this that qualified as possible. And then, and then as I was compiling all these words, um, sentences would start to appear. Um, and it, it was like, I had to start with the A airports and then the B airports. And then this, so I had, I was about halfway through the alphabet before the first coherent sentences started to appear. Um, and that took a long time um in in terms of the process so so yeah i couldn't have known uh, but i but when i wrote um ava and bob ate all the pie um, i was like oh this might actually work and then it was a process of trial and error um over and over again trying to write you know i'd sit down a poem would come to mind or an idea would come to mind and then i'd find out the words the airports don't let me say it um, so for every poem in the book, there's at least 20 failed kinds of ex failed ones that I'd, I'd get like halfway through and be like, Oh, don't have that word. <laughs> Can't make that, you know, there's no workaround for that kind of, um, for, for that thing that I want to say. Well, I think of constrained poetry in general as an art of compromise that you, you've got the, an idea of what you want to say if you had complete freedom. Yep. And then you're sort of forced into a slightly different version of that. Yeah, and that's that's obviously where all the interest for for you and I, 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 I don't want to speak for you, but I think that's fair yeah. you know, to say that, that all the interest is in that 
problem solving uh and can you make can you solve the problem in such a way that it communicates the original idea perhaps you know or some kind of anterior idea to your reader i think that's um yeah if you can sacrifice something but still get the idea across that's such a powerful moment um for language for poems you know, to say, and it, I suppose it comes back to so many of these cliches, uh, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Um, you know, we can, we can invoke Dickinson here for sure. Um, and that these constraints, yeah, accomplish almost exactly that, that kind of oblique uh, angle on, on our subject matter. Was it... Um... Uh, daunting or intimidating to write because, <laughs> well I'm because I mean <laughs> I think okay there's the answer because <laughs> when I think of how how I write chapbooks or books I essentially see what poems I've already got and then try to fit them together into a pattern yeah uh, and I have a, lo a lot of admiration for people who can commit to one idea that they then have to work on relentlessly someone like like Christian Book He's been yeah. working on the Zenitex for over 15 years. I mean, I could never have the patience to do that. I could, I'd just be terrified to start a project that might take that long. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, there is a poem to Christian in Skywritings. Um, there, there are poems to a number of other poets, um, all of whom I feel some kind of affinity for. So Walt Whitman, William Carlos Williams, Gertrude Stein, um, Dr. Seuss, um, and, and Christian book um, make sort of appearances in sky writings in these kind of cover poems, as does Anthony Etherin, who, you know, that, that was more homage, I think. I don't think I could actually, I don't, I don't know that I duplicated any of your poems um, under my constraint, but I was inspired absolutely yeah. by you. Um, even, even, yeah, early in knowing about your work, I was like, oh, well, that, that guy's a genius and we need to pay attention to your attention to um, the the kind of micro mechanics of of a word. Um, I think that's something that skywriting has a lot to ha has has a kind of investment in. But um, but yeah, as I, as I was saying, like um, you know, my my admiration for um, Whitman and Book um, kind of stems from their their commitment to these kinds of epic projects. Um, and yeah, it was a frightening, skywriting was frightening for me because I did not know if it would get done and I'd made certain commitments. And and of course, there's this kind of impulse to not just completing it, but making it good and artistically valid and worth somebody's time and money, frankly, um, in in the reading of. And I, I'm I'm quite proud of what was accomplished, but it was yeah terrifying at points because I'd hit so many dead ends and unusable poems and or just weak, you know. Sure, I can string these words together, but they're they're not really a, a meaningful thing. Um, and that's it's debatable that any of the poems in the book are meaningful, but I think they are, and. Um, and yeah, that was that was terrifying for a long time, and and there was no other solution but to just jump back in, and try and yeah. find another poem that would work. Otherwise, otherwise you wasted all of that that time. Yeah, and and you you know I think Ken Hunt would probably appreciate that point of no return um, <laughs> moment where you just okay, I guess I'm out here. I've got to I've got to keep going and exploring and finding out. And so I think like the the outcome of that was feeling like I can write now I can do almost anything like uh, it, it is kind of amazing what that does to your confidence and I, I think you probably feel you must feel much of the same thing after after your recent success with stray arts you know and compiling all that together that's that's not so different yeah but um, again I, I work on smaller things and then Group and then they together. combine, but yeah, but I certainly get that feeling if I when I've achieved a big constrained feat, yeah, it just gives me so much more confidence to do it again. Yeah, exactly. So so every every success within 
my this particular constraint was yeah a spur to to keep going because it was you know it just felt like such a irresistibly fun idea like i yeah i just wanted to do it like it, and then we're in i think you know a kind of tony morrison ask moment where i think i'm pretty sure she, and she's probably not alone in saying it but um you know you put the book in the world that you want to read um you make the kind yeah. of art you make the kind of art that you want to see and and i really wanted to see a book like skywriting so that that certainly was a motivator um when 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 it got when times got hard it's a wonderful book i, oh, I really like it one of the things i like most about it is that variety that you you kept in there because it'd be easy for you to just think okay i'll just write any poems i can out of these these letters and instead no you've got the one the one that's dedicated to me is palindromes yeah you've got you've used part of, of uh, christian books you know to write a dedication to him yeah you know, all every poem has its own concept you know it's, it's, it's conceptual poetry inside conceptual poetry yeah that was that was part of it you know like i wanted to, i realized i could make almost every page a different kind of experiment um some of them are you know um overlap in more or you know in grosser or more subtle ways but um but after a while, yeah, it seemed like, okay, what else can I do with this? You know, the question the question kept coming up. Okay, well, I've done a kind of lyrical poem or something like that, and or I've done a kind of sound poem. Okay, well, what else are people doing with form and with poetry? And I was like, oh, here's this neat guy, Anthony. I see him on Twitter. He's doing astonishing things with with palindromes. I let me try, you know, but under my constraint. Um, so I got uh, pal and romus, um, P A L I N D R O M E S S. And even then, as soon as I found out that I could kind of write the word palindrome, I was like, okay, now I have to write some palindromes <laughs> um, or, or find palindromes out of these. Um, out of these airport codes, many of which, I mean, the, none of them will be a surprise to you, but, you know, air and aria um, turns neatly into, um, uh, or, or can be translated neatly into air, into airport codes. And I thought air and aria um, in a book called Skywritings, you know, that air yeah, moment fits nicely. felt good. You know, that felt good. Um, but you can yeah like like it turned in uh, what felt really restrictive actually ended up being quite flexible it was it was kind of astonishing um the number of different things that were possible within what felt like at first a almost hopelessly constraining um restriction and i love the fact uh, as you said a minute ago i love the fact that you wanted the poems to be good and not just satisfying the constraint which is something that I see there being kind of a problem with, with a lot of conceptual and constraint-based poetry. But satisfying the constraint or satisfying the concept is enough. That will do. Yeah. Again, you know, I would say Christian Book, um, who's, who, or Darren Wurschler, the poems are still pretty, you know, and fun. There's rhythm and image. All of the things, all of the things that make a good poem, you can't sacrifice those things. Um, at the altar of some kind of concept, you know. Um, we have had this sort of great monolithic and really boring, you know, works of conceptual and uncreative writing, you know. Um, and 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 they're 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 amazing themselves in their kind of brute application of a kind of ethical standard of completion or. Um, or exhaustion or something like that. Like, I think that's, th th those are fantastic on their own terms, but, but I do still like poetry um, yeah. for, for all the reasons that I think a lot of people like poetry in, in its, in its aesthetic quality in, in its joy and play with language. So honestly, I, I, I just like, my favorite poems are funny. You know, I love, and it's because it's so rare to find funny poems. So I tried to be, you know, funny 
um, in my work because I, I just think life is serious enough on its own. Um, so a bit of, a bit of joy. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot, lots of serious poetry around too now, which is a shame (laughs) and a lot, you know, politically inflected poetry and yeah, just it, I mean, there's nothing wrong with political poetry, but uh, I don't no, see absolutely much of it. <laughs> uh, you know, like, yeah, I, I I want to, as as important as it is to address, you know, trauma and and injustice and and so on and so forth. And there are, you know, I'm not going to blow my ho- my own horn too hard here, but there are touches of that. The you know, I touch on certain sort of political issues inside of this framework of skywritings, um, but. It, but I tilt, I think, often towards the fun, um, because that's that's just where I'm happiest. Uh, would you like to read a few poems from Skywritings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Please read as many as you like. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think my favorite, one of my favorites is um, Bodies, um, B-O-D-I-E-S, which uh, has, I think, my favorite opening line of any poem I've written. So here you go. Bodies. Bro, abs age. Jab the gym guy. See, abs ale. Lat jut. Nut lip. Ill sack. Tip top toe fat. Hip hop gum jam. A BMI bod. Buff gut. Tat sag. Maw pox. <laughs> he's earn fit which I love as a final sort of everyone fits in and earn sooner or later and work out as much as you like um, the results will be the same the, no <laughs> doom at the end of that makes me really happy <laughs> um, don't know why but yeah um, Ava and Bob that, this, is, this is the one that really triggered the whole collection for me Ava and Bob. Ava and Bob, her mad cowboy toy, eat all the pie. Cut and run, kid. The lad lay low, but his Mrs. MRS misses him. Um, I think I think one of the things that might get be that might be um, lost perhaps in the in the podcast version of a sky poem is these maps that we drew um, to, to, to go with you. Matt Steenson, um, my collaborator and uh, brother-in-law, as a matter of fact, uh, is a GIS specialist in, in Calgary. And uh, we plotted the flight path that each poem represents um, alongside most of the poems inside the book. It was a, a tremendous amount of work on his part and uh, and they're beautiful sort of images on their own. So um, I'd hate to, I'd hate for this podcast to go by without without noticing that somehow for for your audience. Um, and and thus it's worth taking a look at the physical book itself. Buy the book, <laughs> I, I, or check it out at your looking. You know that's that's a legit form too. Um, but um, but like the 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 map for the arc, for instance, is one one of the prettier ones I always thought. Um, and the poem goes like this: The arc, get dos ahi, dos koi, dos eel. Uh, and I'll break here for a moment to say that it has been pointed out to me that they can all swim and probably shouldn't have been on the ark, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, we, we made the map, so we're keeping it. Um, the ark. Get dos ahi, dos koi, dos eel, dos cow and cub, bee and boa, yak and leo, doe and dog, dos ape, ant, asp, Auk, dos bat, rat, cat, cur, and mog. You and gnu, gad, fly, and may fly. Ram, nag, and pet, pig, fat, hog, pug, and pup. The lamb, kid, and the fox, kit. The elk, rock, and yak. The sea sow, and taurus. Arf, ba, babes, cougar, ka, mew, yip, wag, paw. And get one Noah and his Emsara, one Ham and Nel Atamuk, 
one Shim and his bay, one Japheth and Ada Tennessee, all the DNA and RNA. Get the hay for the poo pit. Get the aft wet, dry the bow oar, row the pen. Yay, see the tour, Ararat. It's very helpful having and and the to work with. <laughs> oh, man. The, again, you know, uh, Sandusky, Griffin, Regional Airport, and Terezinha, Brazil, you know, are my two favorite places on the earth because, <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of what I like about the book. It kind of redraws the map um, and, and finds emphasis in places. Unlike Tokyo, London, Paris, you know, it, my my world um I think part of what this book is doing, it, it, it literally kind of changes the way we look at the world. Um, and, and what else is a poem supposed to do if not that? So, so yeah, yeah. And in the whew, very important. Um, have you have you traveled any of these poems yet? You know what? Uh, it's expensive, have, I guess. <laughs> I, I I think I inadvertently did fly a sky poem. Um, I went from Manchester to Hamburg, to Thessaloniki. And so that's man, ham. And then I think I think in Greece, the airport was SKG with a little creative punctuation. I actually flew man, ham, kilogram for, for SKG. I, I moved the S over to hams. Kind of worked. But, um, but yeah, someday I'd love to fly one of these poems. Um, yeah, that's probably enough. Skywriting, isn't it? If if you have requests, because I have I have a few that I tend to go to, and I think it might be, uh, I, it's hard to see it outside of my own perspective. So, I'm up for you know, like if you see any that you like in particular. Um, well, should we, should we have the palindromes? Yeah, obviously, I should totally do that. Uh, so yeah, palindromes for A E T H E R I N N, I believe is how it's spelled, Aetherin. Um, again, subjecting your name to the constraint of airport codes. It's close um, enough. So, <laughs> yeah, you recognized it. And unfortunately, that was when a poor internet connection intervened, and the recording of this poem was effectively ruined. However, NASA very kindly agreed to re-record Palindrome S a few days later, and here it is. Pal in Rome S. For eight her in. Air Anna Ria. Amo rare Oma. Wrote Ava Tor. Red Ivid Dur. Matt Ama Tam. Sin Ega Nick. Mal Aya Lam Reen Olo Nur Ste Pon No Pets Abu T Uba Ha 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 Ama Nap In Ama Nia Pan Ama Ama Nap Lan Aka Latnal Pan Ama now those last two lines turn into um, a, a man pain, a mania, Panama, the sort of classic um, yeah. multi, multi-word palindromes um, that we that we find as kids. But I kind of like reading it as important, so that amore roma turns into amorer oma. <laughs> um, you can almost hear the palindrome read. If yeah, it that's an interesting your... point. It it brings out the palindrome. We get a, a sonic quality that reflects the palindrome. Yeah, um, I, I've always wanted to try and write out like sonic palindromes. Apparently, hair wash in the shower. If you play that backwards, it says hair wash in the shower. Like it, it, you know, like like when you spin a Led Zeppelin record backwards, and you can hear you know other phrases in it. When you say hair wash in the shower and play it backwards, it still says hair wash in the shower which i tried there yeah i thought you're gonna love that right so yeah writing down sonic palindromes might be the next kind of 
I'm, I might try that and add it to the end of the podcast. Oh, that would be Hair so washed. fun. Hair <laughs> washed in the shower. Yeah, I, I think there's a little inflection that you might have to make to make it work both ways. But, um, but yeah, I seem to recall that being the case. So yeah, skywriting is 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 kind of a big world eating capacious multi stranded formal experiment you know if i'm gonna give it maximum credit it's also just uh, you know an exercise in noticing stuff that's kind of when you're in boring places like airports um, oh yeah how's and, and, the time yeah you know and i hope if you know again if i'm doing my job as a poet or an artist you know everyone's gonna notice these things now when when they look at a departure board and might start playing the game themselves at airports or waiting rooms of any kind i'm always making anagrams of what's ever written on the, the nearest poster so gives me oh, something that, else that's fantastic <laughs> and i think this is what like constraint poetry does is it you know because i started looking around after a while I, and i still do um I start seeing the airport codes or I look at three, six, nine, twelve letter words and I'm like, oh, can I break that up? Is that gonna is that gonna airport well for me? You know? But uh Yeah, I was, the the worst thing is is being a writer of palindromes because you just you read every single thing backwards looking for it. <laughs> oh, oh, what what must that do you, how do you yeah. read the paper? That must be awful. Don't start do you, don't start writing palindromes, it will it will destroy you. <laughs> Oh no, no, no! That is where I, I happily hand, um, you know, the the wheel to you and um, marvel at your dexterity with that restriction. That that's a hugely impressive thing that you do, um, and where you might not want to take on really large projects, I can't imagine <laughs> how you do what you do. It's really astonishing, really astonishing stuff, and everyone oh, should go you. read it. Go read, go read Stray Arts. <laughs> it's very nice. It was, it's a, a perk of doing this podcast that everybody comes on and says nice things about me. <laughs> it's almost like it's why I did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, mutual Appreciation Society. Maybe that's the real poetic movement that we should all be going for. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we should, uh, we should talk about your day job as well as... You know, so people don't think you just spend all your all your time looking at airport codes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, if only I could, if only I could just do that. Um, no, that's not true. I, I, I don't at all want to write exclusively. Like, I don't think that's that's the only thing as it may be. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to teach and to work with the people that I work with. Um, so that's kind of a shout out to Leeds Beckett University and and to all of my colleagues in the School of Cultural Studies and particularly literature and creative writing. Um, we're, we're all working, you know, to, to kind of keep that flame alive, perhaps in a, in a general milieu that may or may not devalue the arts. Um, and the humanities um so so it's important to, yeah there are a number of teach. poets a number of poets at Leeds Beckett who are inclined towards the conceptual and experimental yeah um uh, we've found you know a kind of pond a petri dish uh situation where multiple strands seem to have just fallen into place um i think i think we're we're really lucky, um, given some of the personnel that are running around. Um, I'm thinking of Simon Morris, Nick Thurston's just up the road. Um, my colleague James McGraw is working on some really interesting stuff these days. Um, Mike Lee is 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 working on a kind of experimental novel. Um, yeah, and who you know, watch this space in a few years' time, um, or or even sooner. Um, the, there's a lot going on. Um, and I'm lucky. I'm just lucky to be, to have landed in a place where, where it's valued, um, and and we're given the kind of freedom to, to pursue these kinds of, what might look from the outside like really odd, um, projects. 
the most important i think the most important thing are, are my students um every year um they they continue to astonish me some people would say poetry can't be taught some people would say it's uh, it's got to be taught in a very uh formal way mm. so there's quite a lot of approaches you could take i mean the, the one i would say is how, how do you balance uh teaching rules with encouraging people to in a sense break rules mm. yeah i i wrestle with that i really do um i think my practice my pedagogy sort of swings sometimes from one year to the next and and i think after reading a batch of papers i'm like Next year, I'm going to go in hardcore on form and we're going to sit down and we're going to do a sestina until, you know, you can't sestina anymore. And and then you'll have all the rules and then you can break all the rules and that'll be perfect. And and I do that. And then I find that the students, they're mastering the forms, but they haven't said anything very interesting. So then I, I flip and I'm like, OK. This year, I'm going to get everyone to zero in on their interest, and then we'll adapt a form to fit to it. And then the, maybe the poems come across as loose and baggy, and but you know, full of like kind of some emotional um, force, but don't don't have that kind of formal sharpness that that would distinguish a really good piece from something less effective. And I don't like even saying good, you know, but you know, more or less effective, I suppose, is kind of the phrasing that I use these days. Um, so yeah, I it's it, I don't know uh, to to be honest. I'm not sure what the right what the magic formula is, especially when especially when you have a different room full of students year on year. Um, chemistry changes and 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 people change, and I've seen students develop in all kinds of uh, incredible ways. So so what worked last year doesn't work this year, and m might not work next year. I start from a position of exploration, I think, ultimately, and I, and I try and stay open to to whatever they're bringing, be it formal or, you know, content. Seems similar to your attitude towards poetry, your own poetry. Yeah, I can't do much more than that, right? Um, and I can't. I suppose it's selfish of me. I try. I do, I do try and innovate on my on my teaching practice, but but I do also kind of think that you know my, my the best students the best student writers i ever see are the ones who who read widely and and who practice daily and who are who are generous and give feedback uh, lots and lots of feedback to their colleagues and 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 fellow students those if any if anyone's if there is a recipe or a formula it's those three things you know read everything you can and especially the stuff you don't like, um, because you know you have to get out of your own little frameworks and um, talk to as many people as possible, you know, um, and and try and give as much feedback, you know, to other people. Because then you internalize the things that you're looking for in your own work, and you very quickly stop writing ineffectively. Um, so yeah, that's that. If if there's anything that I could teach, it's that. But I can't teach that. I can just say it, and then hope that you do it, <laughs> and then we practice together all the time. Those things, and that that that's either me answering the question, yes, you can teach it, or I'm saying no, you can't. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, it's both and neither. Yeah, exactly. It's Schrodinger's pedagogy here, or something. Like that. <laughs> So uh, what, what are you working on now? I'm at a bit of a crossroads, actually, if I'm, if I'm honest. Uh, there, there is this idea about mass transit that I still want to pursue. Um, so Skywritings is potentially the first in a trilogy of books, um, one about planes, one about trains, and one about automobiles. Um, I'm, I'm doing some sort of early reconnaissance around the trains, in the UK just to see if it'll pop something for me. Um, but at, you know, as you've sort of, as you've sort of indicated, like skywriting was a pretty big and exhausting project. So I'm, I'm also looking to some smaller sort of things that, that are just toys I'm playing with, like, um, 
like poems I can write with a knife, which uh, if any of you, if any of your listeners were vandals as children, they'll remember um, scratching their name into a desk or a tree or something like that. And uh, my name, Nasser, um, works up to a point, but when you get to the S's, you have to do this kind of, you know, the kiss lightning bolt, you know, kind of backwards jagged as yeah, the backward Z. Um, and just on that, I was just like, oh, I'm going to write poems that I can write easily with a knife. Um, and I, you know, I've got a few of them drafted right now. Um, one of them, one of them is a, a rewriting of Moby Dick. Um, and it goes like this. and more technical difficulties but another recording from nasa white whale tail name me what i am native man my wife inlay teeth hewn hazy white veil eat meaty fat aha fate i am inky at the helm in the aft Vainly, I think. Wet men faint. They melt in latex while they axe the flax filament helix. My, the whale equals my Vietnam. The whale, my Vietnam. My manly venality. What naivety. Well met, whitey. Have at thee. I hate thee like hell. Evil fez men hew at the flank, three timely mental finale, whelm neath wave. Yeah, very, you know. Um, oh, thank you. That's really nice of you to say. It's it's a again like I'm constantly surprised at at what what these um, what these restrictions actually permit. Um, I, I couldn't believe I got like the the uh really kind of the finale of the novel of Moby Dick into that but yeah Ishmael didn't but call me what I am seemed to be close enough yeah um so yeah there there are these smaller projects and for now I'm just had to play with those until something kind of larger and more more substantial shows up which might be mass transit connected I'm also sort of cooking up an idea for a novel, but I really, really should not <laughs> tell. I really can't talk about that one. Um, um, because, uh, again, as far as, like, pushing one's practice goes as a writer, um, and I suppose this goes back to what I was saying about schools and, and sort of tribes of, of writers, like, I, I, don't see, I, I don't see a problem with, like, writing conceptual poetry. Um, on one hand, or lyrical sort of performance poetry poems on another hand, or, you know, some kind of speculative fiction or short stories or plays or, you know, um, scripts. I, I want to be able to try um, a wide variety of things from the menu um, because being pigeonholed is, is no fun. So if, uh, if I want to improve as a writer, um, which is my goal, um, then I have to give myself a chance to try all kinds of different forms. Yeah. And uh, not to be cynical, but uh, write, writing a novel seems a good commercial move for a poet. <laughs> hey, hey, man. Yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's have some real talk here. You know, long form prose fiction is, is the kind of mark of the professional writer for some people. And um, I see no problem trying to rise to that. I think I think I heard Christian say on his episode that um, you know writers have formulas for reaching audiences. Um, I think he was referencing Rupi Kaur at that point, but you know the novel is is the form non parai you know that that reaches a huge audience. So why not you know? But also you know I don't want to sacrifice my own sense of fun and 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 play and exploration yeah i mean there's there's nothing wrong with wanting an audience uh there's something wrong with doing something that is that, that you don't personally like just to get an audience but i don't think oh, many yeah. people actually do that 
No, I think it would be really hard to write a bad pot boiler, you know, fiction if you didn't really want to. Yeah. Nobody nobody does things they don't want to, right? Or if they do, they don't find much success. I I don't know. That's again another generalization, but I find it difficult to imagine. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to know what your novel's about, but I won't. I won't ask you. Ooh, you no, that's me. yeah, no, that's top secret. Top secret. Uh, it, it is embryonic at this point, so anything I say now could could change it or may not apply, and I I can't be can't quite be held to to the concept just yet. Talk to me. Talk to me at the end of the year. Okay. Well, you can come back on the podcast. That would be delightful. It's been great talking to you. My pleasure. As always, thank you so much for having me on. And shortly after recording, I tried some back masking, taking NASA saying this, hair wash in the shower, and reversing it to hair wash in the shower, recording myself saying this, hair wash in the shower, and reversing it to so it works please do try it and thank you so much for listening to discover more visit us at pentrackpress.com